The year was 1992. It was October-ish, November-ish. I can't remember exactly. But it was the seventh game in the National League Championship Series. The Atlanta Braves were playing the Pittsburgh Pirates. And it was tied in Atlanta going into the bottom of the ninth. And there's two runners down, uh, two outs, and uh, I'm sorry, two outs, and then there's, there's a runner on second. His name is Sid Bream. Don't take this the wrong way, but he was an older guy, so he sh- wasn't moving as well as he should have been able to move. And, uh, and they, the Braves had used all of their, their players, and they were down in the, to, to the bottom of the ninth inning to this one guy named Francisco Cabrera. Does anybody remember that name? Okay, we have one person, but two people, but that's extremely abnormal because nobody knew this guy. In fact, until he did what he did in that game, I didn't know who Francisco Cabrera was because he was just a backup. Francisco Cabrera comes up, he swings, he hits a base hit into right, I'm sorry, into left field. And Barry Bonds is the left fielder and he has a cannon of an arm and Sid Bream's on second base. And as soon as he hits the ball, Sid Bream's running, he rounds second, he slides into home and is safe. Now, I remember, I remember that very well because I remember jumping up and down when it happened. When, when seeing that happen. But as I look back on that experience, uh, the last time, you know, back in the 90s when the Braves actually won games, uh, as I look back on that experience, I think about how much I would have given anything to be Francisco Cabrera in that moment. You know, but, because I feel like for most of us, we can all relate to the Francisco Cabreras can't we? I mean, because Francisco Cabrera was one of those guys that, well, I mean, frankly, he was good enough to be in the major leagues, which is, you know, good enough for me. But when you, when you think about it, he just never got to play. He wasn't a great baseball player. He was really just kind of, kind of average, but he got to make the difference in that one game. Now, granted, the Braves went on and lost the World Series, as they did most of the time. But for that one moment, Francisco Cabrera was a difference maker. I want to talk about that for 2016. I want to talk about what it means for us to be difference makers about what it means to, to, to make a difference in this, this world that we live in. Because I don't think that it's just, I know it's, it's deep within, within men to want to make a difference, to, to, want to, to, to want to have an impact. But I believe it's within every single one of us, men and women, that we want to impact the world that we live in. And the truth is, is Christ wants us to impact the world that we live in. Christ has called us to make a difference in the world that we live in. So if you've got a Bible, if you don't, turn to page 888 in the Bible in that pew in front of you. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 5 verse 13. We're going to look at one verse or we're going to focus in on one verse right here. And uh, it was told to me before I, got, uh, before I got up here that some of my hair is sticking up on the back of my head. So if that bothers you, just close your eyes. I wore my toboggan because it was cold earlier this morning. Or, or my beanie. I wore my beanies because it was cold. So uh, you'll just have to live with it. <laughs> Matthew 5.13. Listen to what Jesus says. He says, you. You. Who's he talking to? He says, you, his disciples, he's talking to his disciples. He says, you are the salt of the earth. Now, what did Jesus mean by that? What did Jesus mean when he said, you are the salt of the earth? Well, salt had three main functions in in Jesus's day. It was something that could, could hinder corruption 
right? Like if, if, they wanted, if they wanted a meat to stay longer, to keep from going bad, they would, uh, they would bury it in salt. You know, they would cover it in salt. Why? Because it, hinders, it helps hinder corruption. Another thing that salt does is it creates thirst, does it not? And another thing that, that, that salt does is it, is it gives flavor, it gives taste. Let me ask you, have you ever eaten ketchup without salt in it? Raise your hand if you've ever eaten ketchup without salt in it. Raise your hand if you liked it. Oh, well, okay. You have to have a weirdo in the group, right? <laughs> if you haven't eaten ketchup without salt in it, sorry, Jerome, uh, yeah, Carla, I just... Uh, if, you, if you haven't had ketchup without salt in it, don't. It tastes horrible. Horrible. Because one of the things that salt does is it brings flavor. It gives us flavor. And what he did is, is he says in short, he says, salt is a change agent. Salt is a difference maker. When salt is added to something, it makes a difference. It makes a change. And so basically Jesus is saying, uh, saying to his disciples, he's saying, you're the ones in the world who are going to initiate change. You're the ones in the world that are going to make a difference in this world. He said to you, he said, disciples of mine, you are the salt of the earth. You're going to slow down the corruption in the world. Now, you can't stop the corruption in the world. We can't stop the world from, from, from being corrupted and being destroyed by sin because that's the nature of sin. Sin destroys. Not one of us can, can think about how a, a, a way in which sin, I mean, sin has just destroyed, it's affected every single one of our lives. We can't stop the corruption, but we can slow the corruption down. He says, you slow the corruption down. S uh, salt as, as followers of Christ, as disciples, he was saying, you can bring about thirst. You know what Jesus said? Jesus said, I'm the living water. How do people thirst for the living water? They'd be around disciples who have drank from the living water. And then what does salt do? Salt also, uh, it, it gives taste. The people of God bring taste into a world that needs to taste and see that the Lord is good. Now see, that's what, that's what it means, for, is it, at least some of the things that it means when he's telling his disciples, you're the salt of the earth. But let me, let me put this in context a little bit. This is important. By the way, let me give you just a quick, uh, a quick lesson on interpreting the Bible. When you read the Bible, never just read a verse, okay? Never just read a verse. In other words, don't read and interpret a, ver a Bible verse just by reading that one Bible verse. Always, always, always read verses before and read verses after. Why is that? It's because it's the verses before and after. It's the book of the Bible that it's in that will help us determine what Jesus or what, what God was actually trying to communicate with it. And it's the same thing right here. If we want to know what, what Jesus was talking about when he said, you're the salt of the earth, we need to look at the verses before it. So if, you've got, if, you're, if you're looking there in Matthew chapter 5, at the beginning of Matthew, or Matthew chapters 5 through 7, is called, we know, as the Sermon on the Mount. And what the Sermon on the Mount is, is really Jesus telling his disciples, this is what it means to be a follower of mine in this world. This is what it means to, to, to serve me, and this is what it means for you. This is how you're supposed to live if you're one of my followers in this world. And he starts out with this passage of scripture that if you've, if you've been in church for a while, if you haven't and you, didn't, you don't know this, that's, that's fine. But if you've been in church for a while, you know that it's called the Beatitudes. Remember the Beatitudes? Blessed are, blessed are, blessed are, blessed are. And Jesus goes through this series of, of things and he describes the, his, his followers. He describes his disciples he describes the virtues or the characteristics that his disciples are to have in their lives. And he starts off with one about humility. If, if, if followers of Christ are to be humble and they're to, they're to see themselves as lost and broken and without Christ, 
They're to see them, we're to see ourselves as sinners and, and apart from, from the grace of God, see ourselves as lost. And he goes on and then he talks about, uh, talks about one, uh, about, let me see my notes because it just slipped. What does he talk about, somebody? Oh, he talks, talks about mourning, that's right. He talks about mourning, why? Because when, when somebody realizes and once somebody sees sin in their life, they're to mourn. In other words, they're to, we're to be broken about it. Followers of Jesus, when we know that we have sin in our life, we mourn, we're broken over it. That involves repentance. Then he goes on and he talks about this thing called meekness. He says, blessed are those who are meek. What does it mean to be meek? Well, it means to be meek. It means, it means to have strength under control. It's the idea of this, of this big, strong horse. And if you get on a horse that's, that, uh, that hasn't been broken, then it'll, then it'll throw you. Then it can hurt you. Then you can, you can really get hurt by it. Why? Because horses are strong animals. But when you get on a horse that's been broken, you can lead it. And you can, you can actually have it, have it serve you. And that's what it means as a follower of Christ for us to be meek. That's what, God, that's what God does in us, that we have strength, but it's under control. He goes on and he talks about hungering and thirsting for righteousness. That's hungering and thirsting after the things of God. And being obedient to, to what God says is right and what God says is good. And that's important because in the world that we live in, we really kind of see it as I can, I can develop my own righteousness. I can determine my own morality. I mean, I, mean, I can determine what's right because deep inside of me, I can, I can just see it and, and, it may, and it's right for me. Well, it, it's right for me, but it may not be right for you. No, no, no we got to realize that morality comes from somewhere. Righteousness actually comes from somewhere. You know where it comes from? It comes from God. It comes from, it comes from, our, from our Savior. And if, we wanna, if, if we're followers of Christ, one of, the, one of the things that it means to be a follower of Christ, it means to hunger and thirst for His righteousness, not our own. And he goes on and not only does he talk about righteousness, he talks about being merciful. Blessed are those who are merciful, he says. That's people who have spirit-led compassion, who are difference makers by showing, showing mercy. Uh, and by the way, the world that we live in is probably one of the, in some, in some sense, is one of the most, most merciful societies that we live in because we really, in fact, uh, especially for, the, for uh, the, the younger generations, they really do place a focus on making a difference, on helping others. They really do want to want to want to be a change agent in the world. They really do want to see the poor taken care of and see the hungry fed. But you see that where does that come from? That comes from God. He says, "Blessed are the merciful." If you're a follower of Christ, you're merciful. You show mercy and compassion to others. He says, "Blessed are the pure in heart." That's when you're when you're holy and uh, when when your thoughts and your motives are holy. Blessed are the peacemakers. Our goal when we become followers of Christ and when we begin to walk with God is to reconcile others to Him. See, that's what it means to be a peacemaker. That our goal is not, just to, is not just to take our faith and hold it to ourselves, but we, our goal becomes to lead others to him. And then finally, he says that blessed are the persecuted, that if we're practicing those things, it's so different, it's so strange, we will be persecuted. And what Jesus says is that by, by portraying these virtues and by portraying these characteristics in our life, we'll be change agents to this world. We'll be difference makers in the, this world. That if, if we portray these things about being merciful and being peacemakers and, and hungering and thirsting after righteousness and being pure of heart, having pure and holy motives, we will be salt on this earth and salt in this world. But Jesus continues, look at what he says, it goes on. Let's see again, Matthew 5, 13, he says, you are the salt of the earth. But he says, but if the salt should lose its taste, how can it be made salty? 
See, Jesus knew, and his followers would have known this too, that it's possible for salt to become corrupted. And that when salt, he says, that it's, it's possible for that salt to become corrupted. When it's corrupted, it can't be made salty again. When it becomes impure, it's impossible for those impurities to be removed. So he goes on and he says in verse 13, it's no longer good for anything but to be thrown out and trampled by men. That salt, when it's been in, corrupted and been made impure, it's no longer good for anything to be, been, be thrown out and trampled by men. So he says that it's, it's worthless. Now again, the question is, do we want to be useful while we're in this life? Do we want to be difference makers in this life? Or do we want to be worthless while we're in this life? Now, we want to make a difference. And Jesus says that if you're one of my followers, you will be a difference maker. If, if, those, if those, those things, those eight or nine characteristics and virtues that he talked about, if those describe you and they describe me, and maybe we don't do it perfectly all the time, but overall their description of us, guess what? You're salt. You have the potential to be a, cha a change agent. But we need to understand one thing that's really important here. We can only be a change agent in this world because Jesus first became a change agent in this world. We can only make a difference in this world because Jesus first came and made a difference in this world. Because, because 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ left heaven and he came here to earth and he gave his life on the cross. He died in our place. He received a punishment that, that I deserved and that you deserve. He received all of that punishment upon himself. And he promises that if we'll, if we'll receive that gift, that, that salvation, if we'll receive that, he promises us that we'll be forgiven of our sins. The Bible says that he'll place our, our sins as far as the east is from the west. Or the east is from the west. That he'll place our sins that far. That he'll, that he'll forget them. That he'll never bring them back up again. If we receive him and, in, and he'll give us eternal life. That's the promise that we have. That's important because the only way you can be a change agent is because Jesus was for the first change agent. You can't be who Jesus wants you to be on this earth except by Jesus. Now listen, I know that this isn't what we really do in our, in our culture. I know, I know we need to be lifted up, but I'm just going to go ahead and tell you, if you don't have Jesus, you're pretty much useless to God. If you, don't have, if you don't have Jesus Christ, you do more for the devil and you do more for evil than you can ever do for eternity. Jesus is the reason we can be a change agent. But now let me ask you this. He, Jesus says that if, you, if you're not careful, you'll become unsalty. And if you become unsalty, then you're no longer good for anything and you're useless. So then, how do we keep from becoming unsalty? As followers of Jesus, how do you keep from becoming unsalty? How do you keep from being useless on this earth as a follower of Christ? Because let's face it, we all want to make a difference in our homes, don't we? We all want to make a difference in our families. Students, you want to make a difference in your school and with your classmates. Adults, you want to make a difference at your, at your workplace. You want to make a difference when you, when you go out to buy gas. You want to make a difference when you're in your neighborhood. You want to make a difference when you go out to lunch this afternoon. We all want to make a difference wherever we go. But we can't make a difference if we lose our saltiness. So now I want to tell you what you do to not lose your saltiness. Okay? Now this is... 
this is something that you're probably, you're, after I say it, you're going to be like, oh, I, I, you know, that's, that's nothing big. I already knew that. You're going you're gonna to be thinking, yeah, that's, that's nothing. But let me just tell you, this is a lot bigger deal than most of us could ever realize. If you don't want to lose your saltiness, you want to know where it starts? It starts with you. Well, what do you mean by that? I'm glad you asked. Turn to Romans chapter, well, you don't have to turn there. Actually, I think I'm gonna put it on the screen, but you can turn to Romans chapter 12 and we're gonna read verses one and two. We wanna be change agents in the world and if we wanna be change agents in the world, it starts with us. Look at what he says in Romans 12, beginning in verse one. He says, therefore, brothers, again, Paul, the Apostle Paul is talking to Christians here. He says, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God or because of the mercies of God, because of everything that God has done for you, because of he gave his son, Jesus, he says, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, I urge you or I charge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice. He says, holy and pleasing to God. He says, this is your spiritual worship. In other words, Paul says, it starts with you. It starts with me. Paul says, just because, just because you've accepted Christ doesn't mean automatically everything, God's going to give everything else and automatically everything else is going to be all right and all good. You've been baptized now. You've gotten wet. Maybe you've gotten wet two or three times. And all of a sudden, you're going to be, be useful in, in the kingdom and useful in your workplace and useful in your school. Paul says, no, 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 no. Jesus has done his part. We're not talking about being right with God right now. If you are a follower of Christ, you've accepted his gift of salvation, guess what? You are right with God. Your eternal uh, future is already set. That's good news. But I'm not talking about being right with God for the future. I'm talking about being salt on the earth today. And so what Paul says is he says, therefore, brothers, because of the mercies of God, because of what God has done for you, offer your bodies to God. You, he says, you offer your body to God as a living sacrifice. It means going to God and saying, Lord, here I am. I'm yours. I want to be salt today. Lord, here I am. Today, I belong to you. I'm yours. I want to be salt today. Then he gives a command. Watch this. He says, do not be conformed. Do not be conformed to this age. If you don't want to lose your saltiness, if you don't want to lose your usefulness, he says, don't be conformed to the rest of the world. Just look at the virtues of Matthew, Matthew 5 again. Most of those virtues go, go against everything that the world does and says. Blessed are the poor in spirit. You mean Jesus, said, God, Jesus wants me to be poor in spirit? He wants me to, to be humble and he wants me to be broken? Yep, that's pretty much different than what the rest of the world says. The rest of the world says, no, you can do it yourself. You can do it all on your own. You're fine. Blessed, blessed are those who mourn. Now, mourning, that's not, that's not a virtue. That's not a good thing. Mourning's good when it comes down to sin. See, that's different from the rest of the world. See, what it comes down to, and I want to I share with you real quickly two reasons that, that I believe that, that Christians in the church have become useless, okay? The first reason that the church has become useless is because we've conformed to the world. You know what I'm saying? We've conformed to the world. We think like, like the rest of the world. We act like the rest of the world. Listen, we treat our marriages oftentimes like the rest of the world. We treat our spouses like the rest of the world treats, our, treats their spouses. 
Think about this. We, we treat work the way the rest of the world treats work. We treat sexuality the way the rest of the world treats sexuality. Listen, when you start looking at the, the, at the, the same-sex marriage controversy and you start to see all of the churches that have decided to say, you know what, it's, it, that we're okay with this. We're going to accept it. We're just going to show love. The question here is not a question of whether we show love or not. The question here is a question of whether we're acting in the way that God has said followers of Christ will act. See, so many ways what's happened is we've just conformed to the world. And when we conform to the world, we become useless. Now, the other way that the church has become useless is we totally retreat from the world. Now here's the thing about salt. You ready for this? Inside this little jar, salt doesn't do anybody any good, does it? If this salt is supposed to do anybody any good, it has to be applied. It has to be in close proximity to something. And what, what the church often does is the church wants to keep, we want to keep our salt right here. Sorry, Gene. Didn't know what else to do with that. But when the church retreats from the world, what happens? We lose our ability to affect the world. When everything that happens, when everything that we do is what it revolves around this building, we no longer are able to impact the world. We can't be the difference makers. Now, I'm going to tell you where the, where the tension is right here. The tension is in the fact that when we, when we get too close to the world, if we're not careful, what happens? We can form to the world. So instead of getting too close and conforming, what we do is we say, well, I'm just going to, we'll just stay away from the world. But you can't be salt and stay away, and you can't be uh, good salt and conform. So how do you keep yourself salty? How do you make sure that you, you can continue to work in the world? You can continue to go to school with people in the world. You can continue to go to the gym with people in the world and continue to, to, to know people in the world and not be, be conformed into the world's image. How do you do that? He says, he goes on. He says, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is the good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. So he says, we've got to transform and we've got to renew our minds. How do we renew our minds? You ready for this? We renew our minds by daily abiding in Christ. Well, how do we daily abide in Christ? Well, this is gonna come as a, as a surprise to you, but it involves the Bible right? It involves spending time in God's word every single day of our lives. Again, not to be right with God. Listen, if I choose not to spend time in God's word a couple days this week, it will not affect my, my eternal future. But you know what happens if I choose to not spend some time in God's word this week? I forfeit the opportunity to know Christ better. I forfeit the opportunity to, to get closer to him. Because guess what happens when you get closer to Jesus? You become more like Jesus. And when you become more like Jesus, guess what you become? You become a fisher of men. And guess what fisher of men do? They spread salt. Okay, so they throw out nets and you know, fish, all that kind of stuff. But my point is, is you make a difference when you become a fisher of men. If we want to remain salty in this world, if we want to be difference makers in this world, what that means for us is that means we've got to abide in Christ every single day. We've got to spend time with God every single day. 
And what better, what better way to commit to being a difference maker for 2016? Listen, most of y'all don't have the problem that I have. I'm a preacher. Guess what preachers could do all day, every day if they wanted to, and none of you would feel bad about it. Well, preach, but spend time with Christians. I could, I could spend every single day here at this church making visits. I could spend every single day doing that, and I might get a raise. Why? Well, because that's what pastors do. So what that means is, is if I'm going to be around lost people, I have to be more intentional. If I'm going to be around people who are far from God, if I'm going to be salt to this earth, I have to be more intentional with that. But now with the rest of y'all, y'all work in the world, don't you? Y'all go to school in the world. You're there every single day of your life. And God's not called you to be a preacher. Some of you are like, whew. And that's fine. Because guess what? God's called you to be where you're at. Well, why? Because God wants you to be salt where you're at. He wants you to be a difference maker where you're at. He wants you to be a change agent where you're at. He wants you to be a change agent in your home. Men, let me talk to y'all for just a second because, because I, I believe wholeheartedly that the answer to a stronger nation is having a stronger home. And the answer to a stronger home is to have, an, have, have men of God who fear God and love God more than they love anything else. So this is what, my, what, what I want to encourage and I want to challenge you for, men. I want to challenge you to, to be the ones to start it in your home. You spend time in the Word every day. You spend time reading the Bible. You spend time on your knees in prayer. You be the ones that, that, that set the example of that. Men, you abide in Christ. Why? Because if you abide in Christ, you're going to be salt in your home. And if you're salt in your home, in other words, if you're making a difference in your home, guys, then you're going to be making a difference in the life of your kids. And guess what that means? That means your kids are going to go out and they're going to be salt. And they're going to be difference makers. You see, it starts with me. It starts with you. For 2016, this is what, this is what our vision, this is what our, our plan, this is what our, our idea is going to be, our focus for the year. Be the salt. You be the salt. Don't come to the preacher or to, to, to the worship director or the youth minister and say, hey, you know what, you ought to do this. No, 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 no. We, we get plenty of that. No, let's, let's not do that. You be the salt. What difference can you make? Well, I can, what difference can I make? Well, I'll tell you this. You can make a lot big, bigger difference than you can imagine if you've been hanging out with Jesus. One of my favorite passages of Scripture is, in, and I say that about everything, don't I? Sorry. I, I really like it. Is in Acts chapter 3, where in Acts chapter 2, where 3, I'm sorry, Acts chapter 3, got to get it right in case somebody goes and checks me on it. In Acts chapter 3, where, where Peter and, and John were preaching, and, the, and, and the, the Jewish leaders around them said, what's up with these guys? And they, and they saw, they, saw they, they were just fishermen, they were just simple fishermen. And they said, I don't know. But one thing's for sure, they've been hanging around with Jesus. When you hang out with Jesus, you make a difference. He's the answer. So today, before you leave, I'm going to get some, some guys to give me some help. When you walk out today, you're going to receive a little packet of salt. 
Do not put this on your food. Do not wash it. But I want you to take this package of salt. And the reason I want you to have a package of salt is because I want you to remember, Christian, you are the salt of the earth. Not that person next to you is the salt of the earth. You are the salt of the earth. Be the salt. Make a difference. Let it start today. Will you bow with me? Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for your word, God. I thank you for the truth of your word, God. I thank you, God, that, that your word seems to 